Praise the Lord. Dear friends, welcome to the study reflections on the miracles reported in the Bible. Last episode, we saw the exorcism Jesus performed in the synagogue at Capernaum. And we tried to understand what the scripture tells about the evil spirit, unclean spirit, etc. We saw the word Satan is singular. The devil also is singular, singular power. There are evil spirits, unclean spirits, etc. Something more. So often it is said, Ekthros, the enemy. In Matthew 13, 39, it is said, the enemy has sown the weed. Then you have Mammon. You cannot worship God and Mammon together. Matthew 6, 24. So something opposed to God. Opposed to God as the enemy, as the Mammon, the power, the money. Then you have the prince of demons in Matthew 9, 34. They are called the Belial or Satan. Second Corinthians chapter 6, 15. It's called the Antichrist in 1 John 2, 12. A man of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians 3 to 12. So many names are used and all of this in singular. So as a ruler, as the prince, the king of the powers of evil, under him there are these demons. And we have seen what the book of Enoch tells about the origin of the powers of evil. We have to keep one mind very clearly that according to the Bible, there is only one supreme power, not two equal powers. In many religions, we have the dark, dark power and the power of light and power of darkness, day and night, equal power, good and evil. But the Bible tells there is only one power that is supreme and that is God and that is good. And where does evil come from? The evil comes from the profanation or the deviation of the, what is good. God did not create evil. God did not create devil. The devil is the creation of pride. God has given the freedom to worship, to understand, to live. And God doesn't force anybody to do this. You are the freedom as humans as well as angels. So according to the understanding, God created the angels first, all spirits, and they had the power, they had the, the possibility, the liberty to choose either worship God or turn away. So it would be seem that some of these angels decided to oppose. They used their freedom and using freedom against God becomes the power of evil. We don't know exactly how it is, but that is something which we cannot deny that there is evil, not only just a tendency, not only a kind of imagination, there is some power very, very active in the world and also in us. And this power is we call the Satan, we call the power of evil, and is presented as the ruler of this world. And Jesus enters this, into this world that is being dominated by the power of evil. In a parable, he said, when a strong man keeps guard of his house, everything in the house is safe. But when a stronger one comes and defeats the one, then he can distribute what is there in the house. So the story is telling this world is somehow kept under the power of evil, the strong one. And Jesus is a stronger one who comes and defeats and distributes or liberates the slaves of the devil, people who had been kept as slaves. And now this is presented in a very dramatic form in what we call the temptations in the desert. All the three synoptics speak about the temptations in the desert, whereas John doesn't speak about temptation in the desert, but all through the life. Now, to uh, get a closer view of this, understanding of this power and how Jesus is liberating the humanity, the world from the clutches of evil, let us see how the temptation is narrated. I read from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, 
and the angels waited on him. This is the report in the Gospel of Mark. Just very short. He was driven into the desert by the Spirit, not of evil spirit, but the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that came upon Jesus at the time of baptism, the form of a dove. And the declaration by the Father, you are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the, this is presented as the anointing of Jesus as the prophet, declaration of Jesus as the Son of God. And this, with this power, he is being led into the desert. He's being led, he's thrown out. Ekbalain, so called something. The Holy Spirit casts him out into the desert. Forced by the Spirit, Jesus goes into the desert. For what? To confront, to confront the powers of evil. So we have to keep in mind the faith, the belief of that time. They believed that Satan or the powers of evil are wandering in the desert. And they had their experience. When you go through the history of Israel, you know, after the ex escape from, or the exodus from Egypt, they were in the desert for 40 years, wandering in the desert. And they were constantly tempted and defeated. They were tempted by the powers of evil, and they very often, they succumbed to temptation, they rebelled against God. So this was a time of temptation. So it came to understand the desert is the place where you are tempted. The desert is a place where the enemy, the powers of evil is residing. So Jesus is going to this fortress of evil, so to say, symbolically presenting. The 40 days of Jesus in the desert somehow reactivates, so relieves the 40 years of the wandering of the people of Israel in the desert. So the 40 years, 40, 40 days, and the temptation. It said he was tempted. Mark doesn't say how he was tempted, what the temptation was. But in Matthew and Luke, we have three instances. The three instances uh, put in different ways. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, we have the three temptations. First is the temptation of bread. The second is the temptation of casting uh, himself from performing a miracle by jumping from the, in the pinnacle of the temple. The third is uh, worshipping Satan in order to have dominion over the world. In the Gospel of Luke, the order is a bit changed. Uh, first, uh, miracle, first temptation is the same in the desert. The second, Luke puts as the temptation on the mount to see the whole world. And the third, in Jerusalem, because Luke has a specific purpose for that. There it is said, after having completely finished his temptations, uh, the Satan left him for a while. So Jerusalem, the temptation ends in Jerusalem, but then in chapter 22 of Luke, verse 3, comes again. Then Satan entered Judas in Jerusalem. So the Satan who left Jesus at, at the end of the temptation in Jerusalem, he comes back again. So this is a uh, presentation of the evangelist with a particular purpose. Whereas John doesn't say report these three, but there are many times the temptations are presented. So before we analyze each individual temptation, we see also the whole life of Jesus was undergoing a temptation. In Luke 22, 28, he said, you are the one who had been with me during my temptations, the whole life of Jesus. And we see people coming to tempt Jesus, the Pharisees, the, the leaders coming, asking for a sign, tempting tempting Jesus, and then comes also the other temptations, make Jesus the king. So after the multiplication of laws in the desert, the people come and try to take him and force him to be king, another temptation. The greater temptation came in the garden of Gethsemane, the night previous to his death. His the temptation was so great that his sweat came out like blood. And what is the temptation? Father, everything is possible for you. If possible, let this cup pass away from me. Let this cup pass away from me. That was as a temptation to avoid the passion. And then immediately came the reply, but not as I will, but as you will. And the supreme temptation came on the cross. Came on the cross. Are you not the Redeemer? Are you not the Messiah? Are you not the Son of God? Come down. And we will believe. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild in three days, come down, we will believe. 
and even the one who was crucified with Jesus, are you not the Savior? Redeem, liberate yourself, free yourself and free us. Temptation from all over. And even Jesus himself feels the extreme pain of temptation. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's interesting to note, this time Jesus doesn't call God Father. And to all of the times, Jesus is speaking about God, to God as the Father. Father, my Father. Even if everybody deserts me, my Father will not desert me. I am with the Father. And now on the cross, this comes, the temptation comes at the, the climax that he thinks he himself being abandoned by God, that he cannot even call God Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People say this is a quotation from Psalm. Of course it is a quotation, but that does not mean that Jesus does not feel it. So what is this? Why did Jesus cry out from the cross? Why have you forsaken me? So this is the temptation. A great temptation, one thing. And then does it end there? Finally, into thy hands I surrender my spirit. So Jesus himself feels as abandoned by the Father, is a kind of, and standing at the edge of hell, ready to be thrown down. So he takes upon himself the sin of the world. That is what it means. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus felt himself as the Lamb who carries the sin of the world as being abandoned, tempted. And so the temptation did not end in the desert. It was still the last moment. So that is a point we have also to keep in mind. We cannot be safe. Don't think you will not be tempted. Temptation can be very severe and serious and we have to be cautious about it. Now let us come to the concrete temptations. Let us read from the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. You are hungry with 40 days fasting, and now you were declared as the Son of God. You heard the sound. You are my beloved Son. You are omnipotent. Can't you turn these stones into bread and eat? Remember, you are hungry now, you know what hunger means. But there are millions of people in this world who are hungry, who look for bread. And your father gave them bread in the desert, manna. Now it is the time, prove yourself to be the son of God. Turn this stone into bread. Very interesting. If you want to be the redeemer of the world, you have to give them food. What redemption without food? The food is the first thing you need. So you have the power, turn these stones into bread, eat, satisfy yourself, and give to all. People will flock to you. You can redeem the world from its hunger. You can redeem the world and be control them. That is a temptation. Reducing people to objects. Controlling people by your financial dealings. Making people slaves of bread. You give bread and you control them. That is the temptation. So the one who has food has the control. And so you make all sorts of control. So first thing, the greatest need of people is food. You need. And the power of evil knows the power, the worth of bread. Reducing people into slavery by giving bread. So that is, Jesus sees as a temptation. Of course, he would give bread later. When there were people following him for three days and everybody was hungry and he knew they had no bread and Jesus asked the disciples to give bread. So they said, what can I do? We have, how are we going to give bread to these thousand? There are at least 5,000 here. And Jesus asked him, what do you have? Just five pieces of loaves. Enough. 
the five is enough. Bring what you have. It's not turning stone into bread. It's turning what you have into sufficient food for others. Keep, bring what you have kept, distribute it, and it will be sufficient. And God will make it suffice for the people. And they brought the five loaves of bread and two fish and Jesus distributed them and the 5,000 people or more, the whole crowd had enough to eat and more to spare. Jesus is not performing a spectacular miracle to control the people. He doesn't make bread as an instrument of domination. Jesus recognizes this as temptation and then tells Quoting from the Deuteronomy, man does not live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. So you are more than bread. You can, cannot enslave people to bread. You cannot become a slave of bread. You are more. Of course, you need bread and God will give you. You have to work. But you have to give what you have. And so that is the first thing. So putting the word of God in front of the bread. Don't enslave yourself to the material goods. That is the first lesson. Then the second. The second lesson, the temptation I take from Matthew. The second temptation was, Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against stone. That is the second. Jesus um, confronted the tempter with the quotation of the Bible and now the tempter is quoting the Bible from Psalm 91. God himself said, jump down. Why? Why should he jump? Now, you should jump down to show that you are the son of God. People should believe. Who would believe if you go like this, a carpenter? You have to show it by a miracle, powerful miracle. If you jump down from this tall pinnacle and then stand there firm with unhurt, people will believe. The temptation of the miraculous. And that is great all through the history. People are somehow tempted by these miracles, jumping down. There is no use, not at all, but to convince that people that I am the Messiah. You have to trust in God, he said. So what a beautiful teaching. The Satan is preaching to Jesus, the Son of God, the Word of God. So the angels will help you. So what is the meaning? A spectacular event. Impress the others. By doing something that others have not done. There is no use whatsoever, absolutely not needed. But here, in a situation of the, the Passover, when millions of people have come together and Jesus jumps from the top of the pinnacle and stands there, people will believe. There is also a biblical background for that. It was believed that when Messiah comes, he will stand, he appear in the temple. As a miraculous sign. So if you want to be accepted by the people as the Messiah, you have to stand and do the miracle. Jesus understands, takes this as a, as a temptation. It's not from God. Why should you? Jesus told him, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to that test. Don't test the Lord. There is no reason why you should jump down from the from the pinnacle, don't look after miracles. Don't run after miracles. Don't take or make miracles as a money-making industry. Don't attract people proclaiming miracles. What you need is to give the word of God. The word of God should make perform the miracle of change of heart, not external miracles. First temptation was that of bread. The second is the show business, advertisement. You see all over, maybe in the... In the um, media on the wall. So there are so many placards and posters telling such and such a miracle is happening. People are being attracted by miracle. Is not, we have to ask 
a sign of the tempter, the second temptation, the temptation of the miracle. The third is more grievous. The third is domination. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to, the, said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. It's very clear. Now the tempter has removed his mask and said clearly. The domination. Here is the temptation of power. A temptation of power that is not only in the atheistic world or political world, a temptation of power can be also in the very sacred world of the church. Greed for power. To become the powerful. And Jesus is telling this greed for power to dominate the others is a temptation from the devil, not an inspiration by the Holy Spirit. You shall worship only God. Don't try to become the master of others. Don't try to dominate. And this is a temptation. And that we have to learn the power, the authority does not mean pushing down the others, putting your foot on the head of the others. It's kneeling down, washing the feet of the disciples. That is the way Jesus has taught. So these three temptations somehow is epitomizing the whole temptation. The temptation of material power, temptation of miraculous, and the temptation to power, dominion over the others. So this is how Jesus confronts the devil and he wins the victory after this over. Now the consequence, what is there? What else remains as a means of redemption? No social work, no food supplying, no extraordinary signs being shown, no power over the others to control. What is the means? What is the means of redemption? How does Jesus liberate the people, the humanity, from the clutches of Satan? Only one thing, the cross. Through the cross. So Jesus chooses the way of the cross. Not the way of miracle, not the way of um, domination, not the way of bread, but the way of suffering. Suffering to the end. So Jesus confronts the powers of evil and defeats the evil through his cross. That's the triumph of the cross, that's suffering. And what does the cross mean? Cross means nothing else but the extreme surrender love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So the, love, the, the means of redemption is that of love that surrenders one's own self unto the cross. So the victory of Jesus over the powers of evil is through his surrender, obedience to the Father, total surrender represented in the cross. Not my will, but your will be done. Now, he has the cross in front of him and he has won his victory over the powers of evil and that will be somehow manifested in all through the miracles and all through the teaching, preaching of the gospel. Just let us conclude with a prayer. Heavenly Father, enable us to recognize the inspirations of your spirit, our own desires and the temptations of the powers of evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>